Our next speaker is um, Professor Anthea Thinker. She's Professor of Social Gerontology from King's, uh, at King's College in London. And she's come from the United Kingdom to speak to us today. And she's going to speak to us about um, other models of care, models of care in other countries. So thank you very much, Anthea, for coming. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much indeed for asking me, uh, Justice Lefoy, and also to Sharon and John for such excellent administrative support, really wonderful. I take a deep breath now because the last presentations are really so difficult to follow, I think. All I can say on a light-hearted note is I'm so glad to be here and not in London. <laughs> not at all amusing to be there. Um, the papers in the pack uh, were not my presentation. Can you... Mark? Can you, hear, can you hear me? OK. Um, the papers in the pack are not my presentation. Um, I have all the originals here, all the reports, which I'm now going to give to Sharon, um, so that if uh, needed, if you need to consult them in, in the future. Um, has everybody got a copy of the handout now, the PowerPoint presentation? Excellent. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about long-term care and it's based on three major pieces of research. And I'm going to um, talk about these specifically uh, weighted towards the former. So don't panic if you think, goodness me, is she ever going to stop? No, I'm good at timing. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about work for the Technology Strategy Board that we did, which is research across the world, the background and findings. Then I'm going to talk about age-friendly cities, because although we may have something to teach you in London, in Dublin you have something to teach us. And then I'm going to say something uh, about a very large research project that I'm involved in, mobility, mood, and place, and then come to some conclusions. And so um, the, the first major piece of research was funded by the Technology Strategy Board, now called Innovation UK, where they had a very interesting program of work called Assisted Living. Part of that was called revolutionizing long-term care. And those were my terms of reference, and I was told very firmly, revolution, revolution. And our research was part of the scoping for this initiative. And the vision was for alternatives to institutional care. Although I did say at the beginning, I am not one to knock institutional care, and you heard from the person in the nursing home how good that was. I think we are in danger although I'm a great proponent, as you'll see, of staying at home initiatives, I think we are in danger uh, and stigmatizing both people who live and who work in institutions. So let's get that out of the way. Um, so our report was based on an analysis and literature and policy documents across the world, mainly focusing on Europe. They're based on evaluated initiatives. I'm a researcher. It's very easy to find lots of articles lots of so-called research, which is people promoting their own research, but there is no evaluation. How can you possibly judge a scheme, anything, whether it's sheltered housing or whatever, if you do not have some proper form of evaluation? Although in the report which Sharon's got, we did look at some promising developments as well, but not particularly ones that were evaluated. We identified very early on the Netherlands having a very similar demographic profile to the UK, particularly England, gone through World War, two world wars, uh, a seafaring nation and so on, uh, and they appeared to have good examples. Now, I do a lot of research for the Netherlands. I have to uh, say one of the reasons is because they all speak English. It's the most wonderful place to do research in. But more realistically, the Netherlands, we have got quite a lot to learn from, although not as much as we expected. Now, we were asked, and this was very ambitious, uh, to consider the timescales of 2012, 2020, 2050. Now, we heard, obviously, this morning from Deirdre a lot of um, statistics. I am very interested in forecasts. And I do have grave reservations, and I talked to Deirdre about this afterwards, very grave reservations about projecting too far ahead. For example, older women living longer. I don't think this is going to happen. Women are now indulging in more smoking, more dangerous activities, drinking, and so on. 
I do not think that women are going in the future, this current generation, to live as long as they have. But that's just a, a, a possibility, which is why I think we need to be very cautious both about stats and about my own research, of course. Um, the findings, the key importance of housing and the built environment, which endorses everything that Michael and others have said, and it was joy to my ears to hear this. A lot of my research has been on housing. Now, of course, health and social care are incredibly important. They're the cornerstone of care for all groups of people, but I feel very strongly that housing um, has been underplayed. Uh, I worked in what was the Department of the Environment, the department which um, dealt with housing for 10 years. And at the end of that, I didn't feel we were any further forward, particularly because we never had ministers who put it forward. Um, I do feel the key role of housing is most of the underdeveloped areas, not so much of research, but of policy and practice. And the built environment, my last example, is the example of that where we are now paying much more attention to what happens in our surroundings. Um, so the findings, now most people live in a home of their own, 95% in Ireland and 95% in the UK, and not specialist housing. Although I'm going to talk about special housing and special innovations, because that's what I was asked to talk about, particular things which we might try to develop in, in the future, both in the UK and here. Um, I think that we really need to also focus on these 95% who need appropriate housing, and as Michael has said, has a preventive role, of key importance is home modifications. And research shows that this is cost effective. Home modifications that older people actually want. I've done research on that. Uh, with groups of older people, and the one message that comes across is, ask us, how many bathrooms have you been into where there's all this clutter behind the bathroom door, never used? And the other thing they said to us, please, not white plastic. We do not want a lot of white plastic around our homes. And so home modifications, whether it's major, um, putting in a stair lift, or whether it's small, um, that is absolutely key and is cost effective. Research shows that. Housing with care, and there are different models of this. We've heard one or two. The early evaluation, the one that I did in the Department of the Environment, way back 1989, showed that it was very popular. Um, this is what used to be called very sheltered housing. It's now called extra care housing, where you've got your sheltered housing, you've got your uh, flat or bungalow, you've got your communal facilities, uh, you've got a warden or someone on care uh, 24 hours a day, and the, the key thing we took as the determinant of extra care housing was at least one meal a day provided on the site, whether it was to you in your own home or whether it was in some communal dining room. Now, extra care, um, is it, the research that I did, and I'll tell you in a moment we've moved on from this, showed it was very popular with management, very popular with older people and staff, but generally more expensive than staying at home. Now, if you think about it, if you need such a high degree of facilities on site and 24-hour care, then it is going to be more expensive than providing care for someone in their own home. Now, I too have been a carer of my husband, and we had started off with 24-hour care in eight-hour shifts in our own home, and that was horrendously expensive, and it did not work for a very long time. So it, is, uh, it can be the cost-effective option, but it may not be. It may not be. So extra care housing is especially valuable for frail older people, but some schemes are outdated. I did some research which showed a lot of schemes were incredibly outdated, and we did a project which was about remodeling sheltered housing so that the homes, the sheltered housing, and indeed we did care homes, could be remodeled in some way to make them more acceptable. Uh, the update on my research, recent evaluations, again, have been very positive, but important to note, less than 10% of the 10% of the people who live in their own homes are in that particular form of housing. Sorry, that's back. Uh, the key findings of ne Anne Netton's research were People had generally made a positive choice to move into extra care housing. That's important. 
Were they shuffled in there just because somebody said, you've got to go? High expectations often uh, focused on an improved social life. After they'd moved in, most people reported a good quality of life. They enjoyed a good social life. They value, valued the social activities and the events that were on offer. Not everybody, of course. Some, like our nursing home person we heard from, is a solitary person, doesn't particularly want to get involved in that. The study also found the most important attractions of extra care housing, which are very similar to live in your own home, your own front door, so somebody actually has to knock uh, and you can close the door, you can have your privacy. Flexible on-site care and support, it isn't the same for everybody. You will, it, it may come and go depending on whether you've had a fall and so on. Security, now security is actually interesting because security people often think, and in that research, um, people said security was what they wanted. But I have to tell you, in some areas where I live, for example, in North London, uh, a scheme was actually targeted by con men because the sign was up, sheltered housing for older people, and they were able to get in. So, you know, there are pros and cons of labelling something. Accessible living arrangements and bathrooms and the size of the accommodation. Uh, more recent, even more recent research suggests it may not be economic. Now, here's something coming more and more into the findings. Is it economic? Is it cost effective? You have to take this into account whether you make your final decision on this is another matter. It may not be economic for all schemes to have a range of communal facilities. Maybe you don't need everything. And these and on-site staff may not be affordable. And so you may have to perhaps share with another scheme. They also, this report, um, this is something new, put the case for the provision of two bedroom flats. Most extra care housing is one bedroom which might encourage people to downsize, enable you to have a grandchild to stay, have a carer, a couple may want to sleep separately for all sorts of reasons. And this is something, a new part of the scenario, the two bedroom option. Findings across the world, moving on from what we've done in the UK to different models of extra care housing, tending to focus on small clusters of housing, not necessarily called extra care housing, with varying degrees of support. A long history of this in Scandinavia, and some have a proportion of flats for people with high needs. In other words, you may have a block of flats. Some of them will have special facilities, but they are in the midst of what I quote normal, um, unquote, uh, group of flats. In Spain, in Barcelona, they developed large blocks of purpose-built flats with telecare. All of them have got telecare, round-the-clock staff assistance. In the Netherlands, there's an initiative called Apartments for Life, started by the Humanities Foundation, with a wide choice of care, and they can either be bought or rented, and that's an interesting development. Also in the Netherlands, there's an emphasis on making residential care homes more home-like, and in one, um, where my researcher went, there's interaction with the neighbourhood, including older school children coming in after school to work with staff. And this was absolutely excellent. The school children, they were actually paid a small sum. It counted on their CV for getting into university and so on. They did a kind of internship. They were paid. That was useful for them. Um, and they learnt a lot from the older people as well. This is something which I think perhaps ought to be encouraged. In wider golf help, variety of buildings allowing uh, for transitions of care. Again, another model, a care hotel, for example, which has got six rooms specifically for rehab and transitions. You can go there, um, instead of going straight back to your home after hospital, you can go there for perhaps six weeks, something like that. Also in the Netherlands, there's Hodwick Village, designed for people with dementia. If you're thinking of going, if you're thinking of leading a group there, I tell you there's a waiting list they now charge. They've got so many people wanting to go around this dementia village. It's interesting. It wouldn't appeal to me. 
There are seven different homes within homes, and they've chosen different lifestyles. If you're a practicing Christian, you're a former city dweller, a skilled trade. Now, I come under three headings. I'm an ex-civil servant, I'm an academic, and I'm a clergy widow. Would I want to live with all of those in old age? No, thank you. None of them. <laughs> I don't want to live with people like that, not necessarily, and I'm sure they're lovely people. Um, but I, I would want much more of a mixed community. But, you know, it, it, horses for courses, if that's what some people like, you want to live with people who've all been carpenters or whatever. Um, there's growing interest across the world, and this is relatively new, for housing for people at the end of life and with dementia. Um, and in some models, there are dementia wings, because we found uh, in our studies that um, particularly when the new tenants moved into schemes and they had dementia, there was a lot of hostility to the people with dementia, a lot of lack of understanding. They really, the, the, the residents did not like uh, mixing. And so one way maybe to have a wing, have a couple of wings with some possibly communal facilities in the, in the middle. But I'm, I'm just flagging that up that commissioners need to be uh, aware of the different options that there are. Um, now there are some other things which I was asked to focus particularly on innovations. Home sharing is an interesting one where an older person who perhaps has a large home, doesn't want to move out of it, has a spare room or two, and they provide a home at low or no cost in return for somebody giving uh, an assigned amount of help, which is not personal care. And a couple of our postgraduate students have done this and formed a great link with them. So the guarantee is, whoever it is, the person in return for either no rent or low rent, will guarantee that they will sleep there seven days a week um, and that they'll just be on hand. And that seems to be a very interesting thing to do because if you are, say, a postgrad student or you're an intern, how on earth do you do it if you can't, if you can't afford the rent? Unless, you know, you've got rich parents who can rent you a flat. But, you know, that's not an option for many people. Now, co-housing is another one. It's uh, been predominant in, in uh, Scandinavia and the Netherlands, particularly for younger people it started, uh, but now for groups of older people. This is where a group, and there are a couple now in North London. One, for example, is a group of older women who decided a long, long time ago they wanted to live together in old age. So they have bought and built uh, on a site in Barnet in North London where they've all got their own individual flats, but they've got some communal facilities and they get together for events. Not much research on it, but there is some which shows that there are some tensions, and you can imagine why. <laughs> yeah. Um, technology, great potential. Don't believe everything that you see that the Department of Health randomized control a study said. It was called WSD, Whole Systems Demonstrate. A lot of question marks about that. That seemed to show that it prevented people going into care and so on. But, but th th there are quite a lot. But apart from that, technology, yes. Sensors which monitor your health. Uh, smart loos which monitor your urine. I think all of those have value. I'm, part of, I'm actually part of three longitudinal studies. I don't know why, you know, random selection. Well, no, not the civil service one. Um, and I wore one of these monitors, which I found extremely irritating to my skin. And I felt the whole time during the eight days that I was being observed. I really, really did not like it. But, you know, maybe that's me. But monitors, obviously, and you referred, uh, didn't you, to uh, cameras and so on. But I do think there are really major issues to do with surveillance. You've clearly got to get permission from the person involved. And um, I can't think of anything worse than having cameras on you constantly the whole time uh, monitoring what, what you're doing. But, you know, technology, yes, great potential, I think, for health. So the second piece of research is what we did on age-friendly cities. Um, I did the WHO report in 2007 which was about how age-friendly is London. And then we were paid by the Greater London Authority, although they didn't veto our findings and they were not palatable, 
uh, within these four walls to Boris Johnson. Oh dear, I am being recorded, aren't I? Right. Um, okay. Just delete that. Uh, it didn't go down a treat, I have to say. Um, what we were doing in London um, was looking at local needs, gaps, good ideas for improvement to stimulate development of more age-friendly urban set settings. And we did actually find some really, really good examples where I think everybody can copy from London, such as the Freedom Pass, um, a lot of things like that which were good. But there were a lot of other things which were not good, particularly recent developments with gentrification, Somebody mentioned the zebra crossings. I can't get to cross zebra crossings, and I'm a reasonably fast, uh, fast uh, walker. Lack of toilets. A lot of people do not go out, or they plot their journey by whether there's a loo uh, available. Now, we did look at lessons across the world. We contacted the WHO, and this is where there's a lack of research. We wanted to contact all of the original cities, but we just could not find enough to do it systematically. But they've now extended um, their, uh, the WHO to a global network of age-friendly cities, and Ireland has evaluated schemes, but few initiatives across the world have been evaluated. Uh, details of possible lessons, but I have to say, um, I think the WHO are moving in the right direction. They're concentrating not so much on age-friendly cities, but dementia-friendly cities and also rural-friendly cities, which is good. Oops, I'll go back. Um, now, Dublin um, does have a, a, a very good strategy. I, look, I did my homework. I looked it all up. And so you here have got a very good strategy um, and I think probably you don't always think about what you can learn from other people. Why not, if you've got something to show to the world, why not showcase it? And I do think, at least in your strategy, um, this is a very, very good example. So my third and final um, piece of research is called Mobility, Mood and Place, which is about uh, the environment. Mo moving outdoors, walking outdoors, is very, very important for most older people. We've got three work packages. One is co-created environments, which brings together researchers, designers in training. That's a part of the research I've always been involved with in other projects. Get them young. Not necessarily young. Get them inexperienced. I mustn't be ages. They're not necessarily young. Get designers, get the architects who are starting out, get engineers, get them involved in these co-created environments. So you work together, and I'll give you the example of that in a moment. The second one is environment and effect. Uh, I'll show you the picture of that in a moment, which is where you have neural imaging on uh, somebody's head. They walk around, and it can be recorded, the effect on their brain of um, the environment. And the last one I'm not going to talk about is a big longitudinal study. We've got data for 60 years of people, where they've lived, and all their, uh, what's happened to them. So this is, this was, um, I've only got two slides more, I think. Um, this is the example where we're bringing together researchers, designers in training. This is where, including stroke survivors, people with dementia. Here's the example in Hackney, where we had groups of older people um, they went round the area, and uh, they suggested they went. Each person went with a, with a researcher, and they went round the area, and they thought what could be changed, what could be improved. And they came back. They told the architects in training, "This is what we think." And then the architects in training went away. Six months later, brought back the older people and said, "Is this what you wanted?" So that is, I think, a very very good example. Uh, in Orkney, we did a similar thing. Now, the interesting thing about these examples of working with older people is some of the findings are counterintuitive. And my main message is, if you work with older people, you won't always get what you expect. For example, in Hackney, what they said, these older people, was they liked the graffiti. The whole, the whole area... It's where the Olympics were. The canal, everything is covered in graffiti. They said, not in my row. It shows it's a vibrant area. We've got people moving in, younger people, and so on. The Orkney, again, is very interesting. Rather than focusing on their own needs and better pathways and so on, they focused on getting work for the younger workers. How can we keep it? They said, there's wood here. There's people who can do needlework, people who can do knitting. Why can't we do something like that? 
Who would have thought that when you're asking people about design? So that's an example of where I think we should invite, uh, we should always take older people. Here's the example of where the older person walks around uh, with this neural imaging completely, it doesn't do anything to you. I mean, Hackney, it was quite funny actually. Uh, nobody commented, nobody commented. You know, maybe this is par for North London. Whether they thought it was a, a, one of these fascinator hats, nobody blinked a, blinked a bit. And so my conclusion from all the research that I've um, mentioned is the need to involve older people at all stages. I didn't mention this with the long-term care, the European one. Absolutely, if you don't involve older people, you're lost. And it means all stages of policy and research, not just those who are brought in at the end to help evaluate the policies. Thank you. <laughs>